So I'm here with Angela, and in a previous interview, we were talking about kids and technology and devices uh, and how these days, often people look at their device when they're with another person. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? Like if you're eating with somebody, you're at dinner, is it okay to check your phone? We have a rule in our house, no phones at the table. Very Absolutely nice. no phones. Because, you know, you see people, they meet in restaurants, they sit around a table, the food comes, but everybody's looking into their phone and engaging with whatever they're doing on their phone and not talking to the people who have met them. And you see people walking on the, on the subway, the street, head in their phone. It's, you know... It is crazy. It's really sad. And if you think about it, we used to have, you know, manners, uh, things you couldn't do. For example, no elbows on the table. Uh, no hats inside the house. I mean, it sounds silly, but I remember those rules as a kid. Like, yes. You know, the one that was really hard was the no elbows on the table. Yeah. So it's interesting that we don't have uh, new rules. Like we should reinvent them. Like you can't have your phone on during the plane when it takes off. Mm -hmm. So your rule is a really good idea. Yeah. No phones at the table. So you're an English teacher. What do you think about phones in the classroom? If they're on a break. I always call it their text break because when I'm teaching um, English out here, I find that people have got their phone to their hand and maybe they're Googling a word or something. So it's, it's not, not too much of a distraction. But when you stop them for a break, as soon as you say, let's have a break now, they're all out with their phones and they're sitting individually looking at their phones. And it's silence. I know what you mean. Like, silence. I'll teach. And it used to be you would say, okay, take a break. And it would be really loud. They would start talking with each other. And these days, it's just silence. They just go and they do that, that motion of just flicking with their finger as they're scrolling down. And um, I know I just sound like, you know, some old guy. Hey, get off my lawn. Uh, and I have the same problem. I want to check my phone all the time. But I have to admit, it's, it's strange, I think. Yes. Yes, and now you need to even check your phone. You can just look at your Apple Watch or your right. your watch on your wrist. It's going to tell you if your phone needs your attention. Well, it used to be where I would say things like, you know, as a teacher, you're teaching, and you can see if a student's looking down at their phone. Yes. And I would say, hey, don't check your phone. But now these days, kids actually call me on it. They're like, oh, I'm looking up a word, or oh, I'm checking something. And they literally are checking something. And the kids are good at using their phone as a learning tool. Yes, I think that's fine. So it is, it's a, it's a gray area it's these days. Area. Yeah. Yeah. So when you're with somebody, you never pop out your phone. I would admit that I would be guilty of checking my phone in my bag, but I would never get it out and go on Facebook or Instagram and stop Instagramming. I would just look at it and put it away. Yeah. I, there's other things I've done. I mean, it could be because I'm getting older, uh, but uh, for example, I try not to listen to my iPod so much anymore or my phone, radio, music, whatever. Uh, I actually just try to listen. I notice that when I'm always listening to everything, I kind of tune the world out, and I might miss things. You will miss things. And, you know, you see people... I've, I've been quite um, tempted some days to put my earphones in and walk to the BTS. But actually, I think, no, you'd miss the traffic noise, you'd miss the tuk-tuks, you know, you'd miss a dimension of the world that's happening around you. And then you get on the BTS, and everybody in the carriage is head down, yeah. In the same position on their phones. Yeah. That's, it is. And, and actually, I don't do it just for that reason because I notice that I'm missing out. Um, it's so tempting, but, I, I, you know, I might see something. So, Anthony, we're talking about Bitcoin. Now, you've invested in Bitcoin before. Yeah, yeah, a bit. Right. Do you still invest a lot now? Uh, I haven't recently. Okay, so why did you stop? Uh, I stopped because um, I was getting a little anxious about seeing my portfolio swing like in, up and down by like five, six, seven thousand dollars in in a day, and uh, I kind of decided that I would take out the money that I invested in it and just let my profits ride, basically. Right. So. Basically, originally then, you were using Bitcoin for speculative purposes, right? Not to actually buy things. You weren't using it as a means to actually make transactions. That is correct. I've only bought one thing with Bitcoin, and that was a, a 
it's called a hardware wallet, which is basically it looks like a USB stick, but it's it's a way to secure your 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 funds. Um, so but, do you do you think that in the future uh, we will have people using bitcoins more? Like it's going to become a, a, a viable alternative to actually for commerce to pay for things. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I I don't think Bitcoin will be what we all use, but it's it's definitely, in my opinion, it's definitely the archetype for what is it's coming. It's a pioneer. Yes, yeah. the pioneering technology. Uh, there's going to be something that is similar to Bitcoin that that we use as a, a digital payment system. Yeah. So a lot, a lot of people are freaked out are freaked out about <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh what are some reasons people are skeptical against it? That's a good question. Uh well, one question that I've been asked before is um who controls it? Everyone always wants to uh to know who's who's in charge, right? Who's the CEO? Yeah. Right? Because we're so conditioned to to this kind of system, but um that is the thing. There's, and it's kind of scary for some people, but there is no control over it. It's it's a program yeah. at the end of the day, and there's no governing body. You know, it there's no there's no government organization that really has this uh, say. I mean, governments, specific governments, will try to regulate um, the markets to a certain extent, but you know, at the end of the day, the 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 power is in the hands of the people that use it, really. Um, and as long as people use it, there will there will be some kind of value to it. Just as long as we use paper money, there's value to it. As long as it's exchanged, right? Right. And some people have made some good points. Um, for example, nobody foresaw the use of e-commerce mm -hmm. or smartphones or social media. Um, but these things adopted and ramped up quickly. Yes. Uh, so do you think this could happen with these crypto technologies? I Is that the right way to say it? Crypto technology? Uh, cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies. Yeah, or blockchain technology. Blockchain yeah, technology, technology, okay. Uh, I think it is ver it, it's very rapid right now. It's kind of becoming a household word. Um, whereas when I first got into it, if I talked to someone about Bitcoin, they would look at me like I was crazy. Like, like, uh, they would look at me like I had a, a hole in my face or something. Like, right. Um, but now it's people, people know. Like even older people who aren't really so uh, in touch with technology uh, know, know what it is or have at least heard about it. Uh, but, but I think the biggest hurdle to mass adoption is that as it stands now, um, it takes a, a, a lot of knowledge and a lot of know-how in order to, to safely – because the reason why I say safely is because if you're dealing with Bitcoin – you're in charge of securing your funds. So, you know, if someone, you know, hacks your into your funds or something, then it's your fault. You know, you don't have anyone to blame. Whereas yeah. if you have your money in a bank, you can't call customer service. Exactly, you can't call customer service. So, yeah. there's 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 a big hurdle as far as the knowledge you need to to safely and effectively maneuver in that space. So, I think until some like second party or third party comes about and and makes it more user friendly. I don't really think it's gonna it's gonna be ready to really take over until that happens because either either peop, more people need to be educated and know how to use it and how to how to purchase it, how to store it, etc. Or there needs to be some huge company that's gonna say, "Look, we make it, we we'll manage it for you. You just need this app or something, or something. I don't know, something like that." Yeah, it's going to be interesting the crossover. Uh, you know, they always say like, you know, be careful what you wish for. You, you know, you might just get it. Yeah. And if Bitcoin or some crypto currency currency yeah. uh, becomes the primary source of, of transactions, I think a lot of the ills in the you know the dodgy stuff we have with banks will seep into it. It'll be interesting if they could keep it out. Yeah. If you, if you know what I mean. But I think one thing that's interesting about the, the currencies is that I think a lot of old people will go for it. I think yeah. a lot of old people usually are hesitant about technology and change, but the thing that they have a lot of money that they're sitting on, usually older people, yeah. and they also don't trust the government. They've been around a long time. <laughs> And so I think these uh, crypto uh, currencies are going to be very attractive to a lot of uh, tech unsavvy people. What do you think about that? I, I think you have a point. Um, I think that's um, – yeah, they'll probably 
more so than young people have money to to invest but um i think that's like i said before it's just there there's such a you know you really i've spent s like so many hours reading about these kind of technologies and uh, just really obsessing over it um and i still feel like there's so much i don't know right so. well i guess we all gotta learn yeah <laughs> All right. Okay, so Anthony, I thought we would talk about Bitcoin. Okay. So, you are kind of the expert about Bitcoin. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say I'm an expert, I just maybe a, a, a hobbyist. So, how Bitcoin long hobbyist. have you been involved with Bitcoin? Um, probably I first heard about Bitcoin in probably 2012 and uh, I really uh, I'm really kicking myself that I didn't buy some then because it was about $20. <laughs> But uh, I so I, twenty dollars per Bitcoin. yeah per Bitcoin it was about okay. twenty dollars. So how much is it worth now? That's right now it's about eight thousand five hundred somewhere. You gotta be kidding me! No, <laughs> I wish I was. <laughs> but wow, uh, I got into it as a hobbyist around two thousand fourteen, a little uh, before I moved abroad, and um, I got into what is known as mining. So uh, to to briefly explain what that is, is miners, people who call themselves miners, they buy spe uh, special computers, which are called ASICs, and that stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit. And the application specific part means that the, the, the chips that you're using in that computer can only be used for one specific purpose, and that purpose is to solve uh, cryptographic problems thus creating bitcoin uh so that's what i was doing i was running a, a mining computer so when you say mining like mining you're you're getting little bits of bitcoin yeah, and it's exactly. tiny tiny fragments exactly you have this chip in your computer your computer finds this cryptographic problem yes so your computer you get the uh, reward yes. by getting a small bit of Bitcoin. Exactly. So usually uh, you can mine, it's called solo mining. You can do solo mining where you're only working with your with whatever computers you have. But what's a lot more popular is uh, pool mining where you, you join a pool and you work together with a group of miners to solve one problem. And once the the block is discovered, as they say. Uh, each block contains 50 bitcoins. So, depending on the computing power that you were um, giving the pool, you get paid out in equal measure. So, uh, for people, that's a lot more profitable than solo mining because you could solo mine for years and never find a block. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, for somebody who has no concept of this, the first thing they're going to ask is, well, who creates these blocks of – who makes this? That's a good question. It's like a, you know, where are we from? <laughs> like it's like a chicken and an egg thing. Exactly. So, And that's a very interesting point to bring up because um, apparent, uh, allegedly the creator of Bitcoin is someone called uh, Na uh, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he is the alleged creator, as I said. But the reason I say alleged is that no one has ever met this person. It's kind of uh, – he's kind of a, a mystery. So no one knows his real identity. Um, some people have uh, had made theories that it could be a group of people. Um, it could be a specific person, that, that, and that's just an alias. But no one really knows who this guy is and where he came from, and uh, he's yeah. – uh, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting uh, uh, concept. <laughs> so then how did this take hold? How, how, how did this get a foot in society? You know what I mean? Like mm. get a foot in the door, I should say. Yeah. So somebody creates this system. This person is a mystery. Yes. But then the internet grabbed onto it and said, hey, this is a really cool thing. I want to buy this. It's just It's quite interesting that this – market came out of nowhere and now it's yeah. challenging traditional currency systems exactly uh, well it started um there was this mail this was like before the internet was even really what it is now but i think in like 2007 i think 2007 2008 there was like a group of uh 
of people called the cypherpunks. And they were kind of like anarchistic um, programmers that were kind of anti-establishment. And they ran this mailing, this email uh, mailing list. And they, they were just collaborating together, talking about, you know, creating some kind of digital cash. And uh, Satoshi Nakamoto was a member of that mailing list. And that's where it kind of gained the underground movement. Uh, and really, I think there's, there's what is called a white paper. And that's a document that's, that details everything about Bitcoin. Um, and it's really big. It's maybe like, I don't, I'm not sure exactly how large, but it's, it's like a book. And um, a lot of the reason it took off is people would read it and they would, they would believe the technology and they would try to try to sell it to other people um, because they believed in it really. Wow. That's an interesting history. And so yeah. basically this community read this white paper yeah. and then it took off From and gained there. momentum. And then that here we are today. Yeah. But I think a big part of it, as you mentioned, is really just convincing people because really fiat currency, I mean, if you break it down, it's just paper, right? It's just yeah. paper that the government makes. It's an illusion. Yeah. And the only reason that it has any value is because we, we trust in it, right? So if I give you a $100 bill or whatever, uh, you're going to trust that you can spend that, right, yeah. to buy something. So it's the same thing with Bitcoin. Like it's a process of convincing people that because um, this technology makes something that is scarce, it cannot be replicated, it cannot be like – you know, without the proper means, it cannot be moved or taken, that it is a valid way of, of transferring uh, value uh, digitally. So that's a really big part of it. And a lot of people have bought into it. Wow. Very interesting.